If you saw my video last week, you saw me collect this caliche clay out in Del Adobe, Arizona. Today I'm going to start on the next pot in the Ancient Pottery Challenge, and that's going to be that little hole comp pot with the burden basket carriers on it. If you don't know what the Ancient Pottery Challenge is, that's a series of seven pots from the ancient Southwest that I've selected to remake this season. And you can make the same pots and upload a photo of your pot to Instagram with the hashtag Ancient Pottery Challenge, and I will share them here on this channel. So Hohokam pottery was traditionally red on buff, and that buff color did not come from clay that started out as buff colored clay. Instead it was brown clay, like just about all the other clay in the southern southwest, but it had a lot of caliche in it. Caliche is just calcium carbonate. So the clay they were using had all this caliche, and when they ground it up on a matate, they ground up that caliche with the clay, and it went right into the body. And all that calcium in the clay helped make it a light color. Now, Everybody who knows anything about wild clay knows you don't want calcium in your pottery. And so these Hohokam potters knew the same thing, and they purposely kept their firing temperature low enough that they didn't get calcium spalls. And so today, I've got this caliche clay. This clay has a lot of caliche. In fact, if I made a pot out of this straight, it would almost appear to be red on white. So I'm going to mix this with a little bit of brown clay to give it more of a buff color, hopefully. So the two clays I'm using today, this white caliche clay and that brown clay from Tucson, I've never actually used mixed together before. I've used them both individually, but I've never used them together. So, so I'm kind of winging it here. I, I really don't know what the results will be. Hopefully, I'll get a good buff clay that I'm looking for, but I really don't know. So now I got that white caliche clay all mixed up. It's time to start working on the brown clay. And I treat it the same way. I grind it in the corn grinder. I add the ground shirred temper. So there's my finished brown clay, and here's my finished white clay. Now I need to mix them together to create my biracial clay. So mixing these together, I'll get kind of a gray clay. Uh, now, when you mix up a fresh batch of clay, uh, it'll continue to kind of absorb water for a period of time. So I like to pour a little extra water in those holes like that to just make sure when I open that bag, it's still moist clay and it hasn't dried out significantly. If you're hoping to follow along today, here are the tools we're going to be using. Gourd scraper, a deer rib bone, my mesquite tree thorn needle tool, a small piece of buckskin, a pookie that's about eight inches in diameter, and the star of the show, a lump of wild clay. So I just start out by making a slab, and let me just say, slab rollers are vastly overrated. You can create slabs in all sorts of ways, using rolling pins or just your hands like I'm using here. And so just start with a slab and press it into your pookie. So on the subject of pookies, let's talk a little bit about authenticity and the authenticity of this project. So I don't usually make whole com replicas, it's not my thing. Uh, I focus on Mogollon and Ancestral Puebloan types of pottery that I make. Uh, in this case, because I'm doing the seven different cultures along the Southern Southwest, I can't leave Hohokam out. It, they're very important. So I'm making a Hohokam pot. Uh, but the way I make pottery, the way I form the pots, is a technique called coil and scrape that was practiced by the ancient Mogollon and Ancestral Puebloan potters. It is not the way the ancient Hohokam potters made pots. So here I am using coil and scrape to make a whole compote, not authentic. So in the end, I hope to have a pot that looks like a prehistoric whole compote, but this is not a lesson on how the ancient whole made pottery. If you'd like to learn how the ancient whole made pottery, you need to look at how the current day Maricopa and Autumn make pottery. 
They're the descendants of that culture and they're still making pottery in the same way. So for example, my friend Ron Carlos, there's a really good video that was made a few years back about Ron Carlos and his pottery. And I'll link that up down in the doobly-doo. Ron Carlos makes pottery that looks just like prehistoric Hohokam pottery. And he makes it all authentic using the paddle and anvil method. And they don't use pookies either. They use a rolled up cloth ring to set the pot on. So that's worth exploring. So check that out. Learn more about how Autumn and Maricopas make pottery if you want to learn about how Hohokam pottery was made. I've never taken the time to learn paddle and anvil. My friend Tony Soares out in California gives lessons on how to make paddle and anvil pottery. So if you want to learn that, that might be a good place to go. I'll put a link down in the doobly-doo to one of Tony Soares' paddle and anvil videos as well. In fact, if you're interested in learning more about primitive pottery, the Ancient Potters Club meets every Wednesday night over Zoom to make pottery. It's not only educational, it's also a lot of fun. So I'll put the link to that on the screen and down in the doobly-doo in case you're interested in learning more about the Ancient Potters Club. So as I get to the neck, the pinching becomes very important to get the shape correct for that neck. So watch carefully how I form the neck here. I've got two more coils to add. So here's the first one. This is going to form the neck of the pot and the last coil will be the rim. Watch how my pinching creates that kind of outward flare as it begins right there. It's all about the way I pinch it with my thumb on the outside of the pot and my fingers on the inside, creating that outward flare. And then here's the last coil. And I'll just pinch that out into that kind of a caricature of a flared rim there. And then of course, smoothing the rim off is important because that is really the human interface of a pot. That's where people are gonna notice any discrepancies. So take some time, eyeball that rim and trim off any high spots, fill in any low spots, get it nice and wet and then go over it with that piece of damp buckskin to make a nice smooth rim. And that's about it for today. I think I'm ready to call it a day and let it dry a little bit. Make sure you got the shape right before you pack it in for the day because uh, this is the last chance, you know, to mess with it while it's still plastic. So uh, take some time, eyeball it. If you need to, you can still reach your hand inside and press out dents and that sort of thing. And then I'm gonna cover it with a big piece of cotton cloth so that it will dry, but slowly. So I wrapped this up yesterday and I went inside, I tried to relax and I kept going through my head that I had this too big. And so I kept looking at those pictures that I took at the museum. And it's so hard to get any scale of reference there because the jar I'm making is sitting next to this huge Oya, so there's really no scale. So I thought about going down to the museum this morning and you know holding a tape measure up to the glass and seeing if I could get some idea for the size. Um, but I, I really don't want to do that. It's going to take a great deal of time to drive down to the university and park and then walk over to the museum and then pay admission. So I'm going to pay parking and admission just to get a measure. And I, I think I'm pretty close. I think I looked and looked and looked at that picture and I, and I think it's I think it's six, six and a half, seven, right in there size wise. And this is about eight. So I think by the time it's done shrinking, we're going to be really close to seven, which is right in there. So it might be a little on the large side, but I don't think it's significant. So I'm just going to go ahead for now. Now, as far as the shape, um, the shape of the original pot is there's a lot of subtlety there, uh, you know, to that form. And to me, this isn't a form I'm used to making. And so obviously as one of my first attempts at this shape, you know, I didn't get it 100% accurate, but I'm okay. It's, you know, it is what it is. And I think it's close enough for what I'm doing here. Hopefully, uh, you know, you can be happy with your form no matter what it is as well. Because like I said, I think this form there's a lot of subtlety to the, the shape and the design. It'd be great if I could hold that pot in my hand and I could measure it at different points. That would be very helpful to know the height, the width, uh, the width at the neck, the width at the rim. Uh, those would be fantastic numbers to have, but um, you know, there's no way I can get that information. And even if I went down to the museum, I wouldn't have all that data. Uh, so today, all I need to do is um, work on the bottom uh, where it was sitting in the pookie, clean that up, uh, make sure everything's nice and smooth and then just let it dry. Because this is Holocom pottery, the finishing is actually a lot easier than a lot of the polychromes I usually make. 
So there's no slipping and polishing and all that. Once I get the form right, I can just let it dry slowly and then paint the designs on it that I want. So I'm just using my deer rib to scrape that little ridge down that's right at the pookie line. And then I'm using the back side of my gourd scraper wet to just kind of smooth that all out because scraping it kind of creates a rough texture. This is similar to stone smoothing that I do on some pots, but this clay is pretty soft. I can do it with just the back side of that gourd. Uh, and then I'm just using a wet finger to just kind of smooth it all out. And I'll go over the whole pot with my wet finger. This is sometimes called self-slipping just kind of bringing those finer materials to the top and giving it a nice smooth, even coat. And so I go over the whole pot, including the rim and the neck and down inside as far as I can reach. And that's it. Now I just got to let it dry. Okay, I'm ready to get this painted. Let me tell you a story. It's over a week later from the last place I left off and I was intending to get this painted and fired by now. But we had this cold weather come in and I kept thinking, I don't wanna go out there and work in the studio when it's cold, I'm waiting for it to warm up. You know, we get spoiled living in Tucson, we expect it to be 75 degrees every afternoon. And so if it doesn't get above 60, you know, it's pretty cold for us. So I stayed inside and I waited for it to warm up and I waited for it to warm up and uh, well, you know, I, I have to get this video out, so I have to get this painted and then I need to get it fired, and then I need to edit the video so I can have this video to release on Wednesday morning. So uh, I'm done waiting. Uh, you know, it's three o'clock in the afternoon, so it's about as warm as it's gonna get at this point. So I'm gonna go ahead and get this painted and move on to the next step, whether or not it gets truly warm today. Uh, it is currently 61 degrees in Tucson, so, you know, a, a little on the cool side you know, for me. All right, so uh, looking at the photo of the original pot, here it is again. Uh, I've got three rows of burden basket carriers and I've got a little bit of a squiggly scalloped line at the top. So the tools I'm using today are, I've got my red hematite paint. This is 50% hematite mixed with 50% red clay. And then I've got my yucca leaf brushes, which I'm gonna apply it with. This burden basket carrier motif represents the traders that would have carried this pottery all over the Hoacom world. You see, almost all of this Hoacom Red on Buff pottery was made in one location near the village of Snaketown and then was traded out over a broad area. So these burden basket carriers, these men with large pack baskets, would have been an important part of the system that distributed this pottery over a large area. To me, this motif really carries a lot of meaning related to this type of pottery and that that was how it was spread. It was carried abroad on the backs of traders. So I've always been interested in these traders. I did a video not long ago about these ancient traders. I'll put a link to that video down in the doobly-doo in case you're interested in learning more about them. But I've always wondered what their life was like, what it must have been like to carry these pots across deserts and mountains. So I went to the trouble of having a burden basket made and getting it set up with a tump line and everything and so the irony is, after I formed this pot, and before I started painting it, I had the chance to go out and literally try the life of a pottery trader. I went out to visit Chad Zuber, and in order to get to his camp, I had to hike a distance. And so I loaded a bunch of pots that I wanted to use at his camp and to trade with him into the back of my burden basket, and I headed off down the hill, and first thing that happened was I hadn't gone very far, and the tump line broke, and a pot flew out and broke on the ground. And to me, not only was it kind of ironic, you know, that here I was trying to celebrate the life of the burden basket carrier and I was literally breaking pottery, but, but also I think it's a good lesson about the life of the ancient traders because this is probably something that happened to them occasionally. I mean, maybe not as often as me being inexperienced with it, but no doubt they dropped and broke pots on their way, sometimes very valuable pots. Maybe pots that they had to pay for themselves if they broke or, you know, we don't really know. Uh, but no doubt it was a loss that happened. And, you know, sometimes we find these sherds out in the middle of nowhere and we think, I wonder what these pottery sherds are doing out here. It could have been that. It could have been some place where traders just broke some pottery. Anyways, that video will be coming out next week. So look for that if you're interested in seeing me, um, you know, carrying pots over distances and breaking pots and whatnot. Now, before I wrap up this painting segment, a tip 
If you're using clay-based paint, that is paint in which clay is a major ingredient. In this case, this paint is half clay and half hematite. A lot of my mineral paints are about a third or maybe even 25% clay. But still, if clay is a major ingredient like that in your paint, keep this in mind. The longer you paint, the more clogged up the bristles of your brush become with that clay. And so what you have to do is every so often you have to take time to wash those bristles out. Just rinse them real good and try to work your fingers over them to clean them all out. And then you'll find that you'll be able to paint finer, more precise lines. So the longer you paint with this clay-based paint, the, the wider your lines will become, which of course makes your painting a little sloppier, a little clunkier. So uh, if you're doing that, if you're using natural paints, uh, you need to remember to take time to rinse those bristles out every so often to keep your painting nice and fine and precise. <laughs> this was kind of an unusual pottery firing. Because the clay had never actually been used before, I wasn't sure how it was going to handle thermal shock. The pot itself had kind of taken a while to dry, which is sort of a clue that it might not have enough temper. Then again, the weather had been very cool and damp. Because I wasn't sure whether it was tempered enough, I wanted to be really careful with it. First off, I wanted to fire it in a shallow pit to kind of protect against thermal shock. But when I got there, the ground was really damp, and so I decided to fire it on the surface. Then the other thing I wanted to do to protect it from thermal shock was to surround it with cover sherds. But my cover sherds are a mess. I mean, they're an insult to cover sherds everywhere. So I need to make some more, obviously. But my covering of the pot with cover sherds was sort of hit and miss. There were a lot of large gaps in it when I was done, even though that had been my intention. The other problem with this firing was all the cool, damp, wintry weather we've been having. So the fuel, the wood, was all a little on the damp side, and the air temperature that morning was quite cool. And so to get a fire going, you know, to get a fire to burn with enthusiasm, uh, you have to work at it on these kind of mornings. It doesn't just automatically take off and hit top temperatures. Because the clay that I'm using is made with caliche, remember there's caliche in that white clay, I definitely don't want to get this above 800 degrees Celsius. And so... Here I'm trying to get this fire to, to burn, you know, with enthusiasm, like I said, right? I don't want it to just smolder around at 600 degrees Celsius. I need to get it up above 700. I'd like to get it above 750 Celsius, but below 8. And tr trying to encourage the fire to burn vigorously, uh, you know, is a lot like pushing a car downhill with no brakes, right? Like, you might have to work to get the car going, but once you get it going, you might exceed the speed you were hoping to get to. And it's the same with this fire, right? I'm working hard to get it to burn enthusiastically. And at the same time, I don't want to get it to go over 800. So in this case, I did use a cheat. I did use lighter fluid to get this going because it was such a cool, damp morning. The wood was damp. It was going to take forever to get this fire burning enthusiastically all the way around. And I used quite a bit of lighter fluid to get it going. And then the final thing I did to prevent thermal shock was... I let it sit there and cool down with the cover sherds in place for a long time. That way it wouldn't get a cool breeze on that hot pot and crack it. So this has already been sitting here for quite a while. And I'm just starting to pull those cover sherds away. Okay, how about that? I think it came out really good. Overall, I think it's a little larger than the original, uh, but everything came out really good despite the problems we encountered. And the mixing of that clay, I think we nailed the color pretty close as well. If you'd like to learn more about those ancient traders who were so important back in the ancient times that they were immortalized on pottery, check out this video right over here, which is gonna go into more detail about those ancient traders. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you next time.